last part of the session. Um, thank you for allowing me to give this uh, presentation, which will be slightly or very different from the ones you've seen before. Um, and it's, uh, it's a presentation about erosion on archaeological site, and it reports on research we've been doing the last few years in the Netherlands on a series of test sites. And this research was in fact uh, initiated because I have argued that if we want to protect archaeological sites and monitor and we assess the, dam the, the threat of modern land use to archaeological sites, we need to know how quickly the process goes. Or to put it in a negative way, if we cannot measure a change in an archaeological site within a generation, then it's not worth putting much effort into, into it. Uh, and then we have several sites in the Netherlands that, is, uh, that are susceptible to erosion. It may sound surprising in such a flat country, but still it is the case. Uh, and we set out to try to measure what exactly the erosion rates are. And uh, in order to do that, we, uh, we cooperated with several groups. So uh, I'm working at the Cultural Heritage Agency. We cooperated with uh, uh, the Metropolitan State University, with Wageningen University, and with Medusa, who is a, a, a private company doing, doing uh, gamma ray measurements. And in our project, we tested a whole series of methods to measure erosion rates. And uh, we, we started by comparing uh, existing elevation measurements. Uh, we did coring to look at topsoil thicknesses and the presence of colluvium. Uh, looked at uh, mapped anthropogenic material at the surface. Uh, look at depth distribution. We da da used OSL dating um, and uh, traces, and uh, we have also the first pilot on the modeling, the, uh, the processual modeling of erosion. What I'm going to present today is only these two, so the anthropogenic traces and OSL dating, and that's partly because as this, those are the only methods that gave some result. <laughs> Especially it was very uh, disappointing that our comparison of the different um, LIDAR measurements did not give any thing that you could use. So the Netherlands is not as flat as you think. Um, we go up to 300 meters here near Maastricht, so <laughs> careful. Um, and in this, this is an, in fact an area that's, uh, that's covered in lus and that has uh, some, so some, some slopes and, uh, and, and, and gullies, and there we have a lot of erosion that, uh, that washes away the, the, the lush, lush into the, the rivers and the, in the, the small rivers into the Meuse. In the north, which is in fact relatively flat, um, we have a lot of small archaeological sites that in fact consist of anthropogenic hills that have been built to, because the area flooded when the people were living there uh, at least twice a day. Uh, and that, those are, they start in the Iron Age and run up to the uh, 12th century when they start building the dikes. Uh, and these hills, these terpen, they run all the way up to, uh, along the coast until in Denmark. And um, that's, this is an, uh, an area, uh, one of those hills in Denmark that is still looks like that it, lo uh, it looked in the past. And um, well, we selected sites, two from the south and one from the north. In fact, two, but one after our first visit, they didn't allow us back in. Uh, but these are sites that have that are permanently under agriculture and they're plowed every year because we thought we need to start this project on sites where we expect that the, uh, that the, the erosion is really severe. So just a quick run through the site. This is one of those uh, terrible living mounds. Well, it's, it's in a, not in Friesland, but the next province. So they're called different. They're called Wierde, but that's a local thing. Uh, so you can see here in the in LIDAR image that's an elevated part, and that is this part on in the field, and this is uh, ploughed every year. Then we have an early Neolithic site, linear banded ceramic site on a slope with a straight edge here, and this is this whole field that is uh, every year tilled. And finally we have a, a Roman villa site, the largest in the Netherlands, so the total area is four hectares, this part is an archaeological monument. And uh, in fact, before we started uh, the, the erosion <coughs> measurement, we, we took a geophysical survey to make certain that we knew where everything was. And then we found the, the main building of the villa, which is 30 by 40 meters, and a lot of added villa uh, buildings and even a bathhouse that was not known until then. So that was nice, but well, that's not really interesting for my research. 
um, because we started to look at the, the field itself and uh, uh, do um, auguring surveys and uh, on uh, the to look at the the, the the distribution of the topsoils and uh, we made up the on the terp side we made small pits until the depth of the archaeological level that we could uh, sample <laughs> and on the the ro the, the lust sites we used uh, mechanical corings so we got uh, 10 centimeter wide undisturbed samples all the depth that we wanted uh, in some of some places several meters and we could then sample and measure and analyze them in the lab at uh, Utrecht. So, what did we do with it? Well, let's, I'm going to show some of the results now. Um, well, I have to first explain a little bit because we use two methods and we have to ad had to adapt both to suit our needs. Some of you may be uh, familiar with these graphs that are usually produced if you do an OSL analysis. Uh, OSL essentially measures how long ago a sand grain has seen the light for the last time. And it's usually plotted like this. The, 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 sample, the sample is split into very small subsamples and they're individually measured. And then they, there's a plot made that shows the precision of the age measurement and then the age that is achieved. And if you have a good OSL sample that is really good, ble well bleached, like Aeolian sand, they're all on one line and you have a very good date. The problem arises often that you have, especially if you're working in colluvium or in soils, that the material, the soil is transported or it's mixed while the sun doesn't shine on the grains. And then you get these mixed signals. Like this one is not bad, but this one is very mixed. And you, get you could even extract multiple dates. And that's where you get into trouble. Uh, a lot of OSL labs just give you a date. And they take the average or they take the youngest date. But that may give you, well, get into trouble with that. So what we decided to do is to make depth plots of the individual subsample grains, uh, uh, ages, to see what pattern we could see there in the genesis of the site. And this is just one example from the, the one of the LUS sites from Bay Kelmont, the Neolithic site, where we have uh, three cores along the transect. And here at the lowest core, you're in, in the lowest part of the slope, Oh, you can see here the, the age. With, I've used several axes to get a kind of spread out the data to get, give it a better view. And you can see here that you start with the typical 20 to 10,000, 20,000 year old lust deposition. And then suddenly in this sample, you have ages that run from 60 to 1,000 years within one sample. And what we're here probably looking at is a, a, a soil surface that has been stable for a long period of time, maybe a little colluvium coming in. Um, and then maybe uh, if you're just below the really top soil that is usually better bleached, you can get root action, you get worm action that brings down younger grains into this old sediment. So in fact what you spot here is an old surface that has been preserved for a long period of time. And then if you go up later you see here that especially, I don't know exactly how to interpret this, this may be the start of Neolithic cultivation, but that may be a bit too much interpretation, but then we seem to go going into the younger ages in Roman and uh, medieval colluvium forming below on, on the slope below. Um, if you go to point four, which is in fact on a, on a saddle on the top of the slope, we see a kind of similar pattern but more condensed. But also here we go to from older to younger to relatively young ages, but then the one here that runs up to here and then stops. And this is uh, apparently a location that has been eroded, but we, well, we can't, see, can't see when, but this must have been eroded probably relatively recently. Uh, we were very happy with the result. This gives us a lot of information on the genesis of this site, on the taphonomy of the site. And we have similar uh, uh, images also from the, the other LUS site and also from the, the TERP site, only the period of time is much shorter there, it's only Middle Ages. Uh, but the period is so long that we cannot really use this for assessing the present rate of erosion. We notice that if you take a present, a modern topsoil, you have still a range of several hundreds of years in your OSL sample. So we're going to use another tracer for that. And then we have to go back in time to the 1950s, 1960s and 1980s in the... 19, between 1958 and 1962, there were about 15 large-scale weapon tests when 
uh, hydro, what do you call them, uh, hydrothermal bombs were let off about 30 kilometers height above the atmosphere, and the fallout of that spread across the whole northern hemisphere, maybe also the south. And they produce a few isotopes that we can still detect. The same on a smaller scale we have in 1986, I was in high school, I still remember, the, the explos explosion and then burning down of a reactor core in Chernobyl in Ukraine that also produced a lot of uh, radioactive isotopes that spread over Western Europe, but very um, uh, some areas got more than others. Um, yes. Now, and uh, there's a lot of negative things about it, but, but the good thing about this is that we can use these traces. There's been a publication by Wilkinson some time back that uh, explained it if you use cesium-137. You can uh, assume that it has been spread very evenly like a blanket over all the soils. And, that, and so if you uh, then have erosion, uh, you will have soils that contain more and less cesium. And the more cesium will be on locations where the uh, colluvium has ended up and there will be less cesium on the locations where it has eroded. Um, in fact, in this publication, Keith Wilson was not really clear on the method they used. They just give sense of age, uh, erosion rates. And uh, I recently read a paper that compared four different rates, met methods of uh, measuring these erosion rates based on cesium, and that gave wildly different results. So that's why we devised a fifth way of doing it. Uh, one of the problems that we have is that all these measurements, you have to, 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 to uh, measure the, the amount of cesium in the whole soil profile and then compare it to a reference site. And it will be very difficult in the Netherlands to find a reference site that you can be absolutely certain that has not been touched since 1980s or 1950s, whatever time period you're talking about. So what we are going to do is we're going to take the average of a field and <coughs> kind of assume that nothing has left the field, but it's only uh, stayed in. And this is slightly dangerous, but we're still still going to do it. Um, there's another thing, and that is something that I've never noticed in the paper, in the, in the, in the, in the publications, that, that we, if you're dealing with tilt fields, there's a quite a lot of difference if the, whether the erosion happens in one go or whether it happens every year a little bit. And just to make an example of this, uh, if you have what, 30 centimeter of erosion, so you lose the whole topsoil in one go, and you plow again, you have a new topsoil that's probably completely empty of all the traces. If you do it in two, two stages, like you uh, lose 15 centimeters, then you plow again, and then you lose 15 centimeters, and you plow again, you end up with the same amount of erosion, but here you still have a quarter of the traces, because it's mixed in with the lower soil layers. So I have a made a, had to make a calculation of how this works. Uh, this is a measure of how many traces are lost from a certain profile, and then depending on the amount of uh, tillage events, uh, or erosion events, whatever you can look at, the outcome of the amount of erosion can be quite different, especially if, the, if you have lost a lot of these traces. So in our estimate, we're going to take the whole bandwidth and say something, suppose that we're going to find 0 0.4, then we're going to take this whole range as an estimate of the erosion. And then there's another question is, are we looking at Chernobyl, which is about 30 years ago, or are we looking at isotopes from the hydroelectric bombs, or hydro bombs? Uh, well, in fact, when we measured our cesium and plutonium, we were for the first time able to measure plutonium from these bonds in our topsoils. We see that they are very uh, uh, well correlated. There were two outliers that probably had an extra input from somewhere in cesium. And if we look at the plutonium isotopes themselves, which lie around 0 0.18, we now know that is typical for weapon-grade plutonium. And Chernobyl should have had something like 0.4. So we are looking at about all the erosion measurements that we're doing using these, these traces are for a period of about 50 or 60 years. Now, this is one of the profiles, in this case from the Roman Villa site, and we see the cesium, we see the plutonium. We have done our uh, measurements, and we have calculated that we're looking at an estimated erosion rate on this side of around 1 to 2 millimeter 
per year in the last 50 to 60 years. And if you look at all sites, we kind of find usually something like two millimeters, sometimes running up to five or six millimeters per year. So we were already very happy that we were able to measure some kind of uh, erosion rate. Um, we're not, if I would do it again, I would take more, more positions because three in the size field is, a, is very limited. But I, at least I'm, we have here some methods that we can actually use. So our conclusions, we can do erosion measurements, with, uh, but we have to tweak the methods to do it. Uh, so we can use the OSL datings, uh, especially if you use the, the, the single aliquot uh, method and uh, take the individual aliquots uh, to look at the taphonomy of a site. We can use the fallout isotopes for uh, the uh, modern, of the last 50 years, erosion degradation processes. And we get then erosion rates of about 2 to 6 millimeters per year, which is, when you expand over longer periods, quite a substantial amount. Um, one of the things that we are really still looking at is, the, is, is you can now predict the impact on archaeology. So how long, long can you continue having this erosion before you're going to seriously lose um, archaeological information? And that's of course, depends very much on the depth of the site and uh, the type of material and traces that are present there. Uh, and there's one thing that, uh, that, we, uh, that we want to, to have follow up in, and we're preparing that now is that uh, we, we started to realize that the, the solution of stopping erosion here is to put the whole everything under grass. Um, but the thing is that, that, that once you go from tilt field to grass, you'll increase cr incredibly your bioturbation. So we have to balance these things, and in some areas we may even think of uh, putting grass on it, but then not, not manuring it or everything to, to just keep the bioturbation low. So that's what I was wanted to tell you, so thank you for your attention.